When you first walk into the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando, Florida at Universal, it's almost surreal. Especially if you follow the books as they came out and waited in line for hours at midnight premieres for the movies. The world of Harry Potter is one of few fantasy worlds that is so well developed that I could actually believe it exists. It's comparable in detail to J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth, but also has the heart and story of classics. But there's something about Rowling's story that is less foreign that makes my thoughts about this world on the same plane as real events. I find myself hypothesizing about the wonders of this world, not keeping in mind that it's fictional. And this incredible world finally became tangible when the brilliant Stuart Craig teamed up with the first director Chris Columbus and brought these movies to life in 2001. Now of course I could make an entire series dedicated to what's wrong with the movies and how they left out a lot of crucial plot points. I'm looking at you Goblet of Fire and Order of the Phoenix. But they adapted them so well that I started having to keep two worlds in my head. The first one was the one I imagined when I first read the books, and the one in the movies. They existed side by side, but after the sixth movie came out, they started blending, and I started having trouble differentiating what was in the movies and what was in the books. Although the movies are far from perfect, they still brought a sense of familiarity every couple of years as we watched these characters grow up with us. That same sense of familiarity and homely feeling is the same sense I got walking into Hogsmeade at Universal Islands of Adventure in 2011. This place is still part of a larger theme park, but immediately you could tell this is a place that was handled with great care. But who could build a theme park that didn't feel like you were in a theme park? Well, obviously, the man for the job is Stuart Craig, the man who designed the movie world in the first place. What we've learned on having these film sets standing here for so many years is that people are unexpectedly overwhelmed by the detail. I think that's absolutely what we must carry forward into the theme park. The amount of passion and heart that came into this project is astounding, and so obviously prevalent walking around the place. Authenticity is the cornerstone and the core of everything that we do for the Wizarding World. And everything, everything down to the rivets and the screws and washers and the mahogany paneling that's inside this train, to the fabric on the seats, everything has been researched and authenticated to the highest level. For most, Hogsmeade is a nice attraction to visit for a day, spend a few hours in, and then move to another part of the park. But for a true fan of the story, it's a place to live in for a few days. After visiting all of the shops on the first day, buying your overpriced robes and wands, and riding dueling dragons five times in a row, you spend the next four days drinking butterbeer, soaking up the atmosphere, and enjoying the quirky music from the movies that plays. But I haven't even mentioned Diagon Alley yet. Our first thought, and I'm sure everyone else's thought after the last day at Hogsmeade 2011, was why don't they build Diagon Alley in that subpar Egyptian area right before Hogsmeade? Of course, this dream came true, but in the other park, and another visit had to be scheduled. Now, one of the best parts about Diagon Alley is the entrance. There's no sign or billboard saying it's even there, it's just a brick wall, like you're entering the real Diagon Alley. After a couple days, a fun thing to do is just stand at the entrance and watch people wander in and see their expression of what they found, especially foreigners' reactions. And to expand on the magic, they added interactive wands that are pretty relentless on how specific the wand motions need to be in order for it to work. This place is so minutely detailed that we constantly kept finding hidden writings on the walls, little secrets hidden in shops, and tiny references to the books and movies, like the Crumplehorned Snorkak in The Magical Menagerie, and The Hand of Glory in Borgen and Burks. The main attraction at the Wizarding World are the 3D rides, the Forbidden Journey, and the Escape from Gringotts. But for me and my family, it was just simply hanging out in the area. We would just grab one of the three versions of Butterbeer, or one of the unique drinks they serve, sit down, and listen to the ambient music and enjoy the atmosphere. Now all of this sounds very nerdy and over-obsessive, but at the end of the day it's just a theme park, a money pit, a popular tourist destination. Nothing special. But we were visiting the imaginations of J.K. Rowling and the thousands that made the story in the park real. And that is something that is truly magical.